Oh, okay. Good, good, good. <laughs> Amakua aloha mahalo. E hoʻu mai kai. I ke ahale. Ami i ke poʻi manu. A mama. Blessings to this place and all these people gathered here. Uh, my name is Suj Kahili King and I represent Aloha International with a blessing. And uh, I'm going to ask Susan to do that for us, please. to begin with a story related to the topic so we'll do that Ikawaka Hiko Mamua Loa Okapena Kuke Law once upon a time a very long time ago before Captain Cook it was a time when the god Kane ran everything he was in charge of everything he told everybody and everything what to do and when to do it he uh, picked the sun to be the marker of annual events. He picked the moon to be the marker of daily events. And all the daily events of the people, and you can, if you study the moon calendar, you can still see this, all the events of the daily people, the fishing, the farming, the mending, the partying, the praying, was all on a particular night of the month. We say a night. The Hawaiian day, we can put it that way, the 24-hour period, in our terms, began with sunset. When the sun had gone down over the horizon, that began the time of Po, which means night, as other things. And then during the night, that's when creativity happened, and at dawn is when manifestation happened. That was called Ao. But all these nights, so we, they talked about the nights of the moon, which included the following day. And everything was very regulated. Certain things at certain times. Right? And it wasn't too bad a life. I mean, one of the benefits was uh, 
nobody had any personal responsibility. Okay? Uh, it was kind of like if any of you have ever been in the military. It was kind of like being in the military. Okay? Somebody else told you what to do and when to do it. You didn't have to think very hard. And that's about what it was like. Um, there were other things too. Um, like I said, you couldn't, didn't have to do personal responsibility. What that meant is, if, for instance, um, Kimo's canoe okay, uh, got smashed up on the reef, it wasn't his fault. It was because Keone didn't do the proper prayers on the proper night. Okay. And if, let's say, Malia's top of cloth fell apart after she picked it up. Top of cloth was the kind of clothing that they used, made of the bark of a tree. And if hers fell apart, well, it had to be because uh, Alika was trying to plant taro on one of the wrong nights. Okay? So everybody could blame somebody else, and you could always blame Connie, because, you know, his fault anyway. Uh, but this is the way life went. And uh, like I said, it wasn't too hard, except there were times when it was a problem. Uh, we talked about Ava. Uh, even in those very ancient times, Ava was a sacred drink. Uh, it had to be used on special days and special ceremonies. It had to be used at the, the birth of a, of a chief, on the first year anniversary of the eldest child. Uh, it had to be used uh, when uh, there was a, a ceremony for some big event that had to take place, you had to have Ava to drink. You had all these different occasions when you needed this sacred drink. Now, Ava itself was, uh, it's a plant. About when it's, when it's mature, depending on where it's growing in the type, it can be four to 10 feet tall, like a bush. And the important part are the roots. That's where what they call today the cavatones are. Uh, but uh, there's more than that. Anyway, it's the roots that are used to produce the drink. Of course, nobody knew that in those days. Because Kane not only was the only one allowed to make ava, he was the only one that knew how. Nobody else knew how this sacred drink came about and how it was made. Now, at this time, like I said, everybody is following the rules about what to do when, except for certain people. Except for people who were called kolohe, which is a term means rascal. And one of these rascals, they, they were people who wanted to follow their own rules. And one of these rascals was a man named, young man at that time, Maui Kupua. And Maui Kapua was a kolohe. He did what he wanted, when he wanted to do it. Most of the time, he didn't care about people. People didn't care about him. That was fine. But every once in a while, he had this kind of a thing. Some people would irritate him with their behavior, uh, especially if they thought they were too big for their malos. Now, a malo is a breech clout, okay? We used to say in English, too big for their britches. Uh, kids nowadays having the foggiest clue of what a britch is, okay? Uh, so, but, you know, thought too much of themselves. So if Maui met a person like that, why, he might play a trick on him. Uh, if he could get away with it, great, no problem. But if uh, he was caught and he was chased out of the village by a whole crowd of people, so what are they, well, he didn't care what they thought. Right? But that's the way life was at this time. But the crisis was coming. The crisis was coming because what usually happened when there was need for Ava, why uh, they would, council of, of chiefs and priests would get together and they'd pick somebody, we'll call it village just because it's easier. Hawaiians didn't really live in villages, but they had, it was almost like, they call this volcano village. Okay, this is not a village. Okay, it's a bunch of clusters here and there. Okay and uh, with some common ground. And that's what it was like in old Hawaii. We were living very much like they used to. So when they needed, they would find, gather people together and they would pick somebody who would have to go up. Now, he'd, Kane lived in the highest part of the highest mountain. And this guy would have to go up. He'd have to carry a bundle of roots 
with him. They knew the roots were important, but they, they didn't know what to do with them. So he would have to carry the Ava roots on his back, and he'd have to climb up through the forest, and he'd have to climb up to the, to the uh, barren places, and he had to finally find his way to where Connie lived. Now, I gotta remember, in these days, like in much of Hawaiian history, the people mostly lived on the coast. Hardly anybody went to the interior. Just a very few special families. Most people never did. But whoever was picked, he was from the coast, and he's the one that had to find his way. There weren't any pathways, and it was dangerous. And there were streams, and sometimes rain, and sometimes evil, you know, wicked spirits, we can call them, that you had to encounter. So sometimes people didn't come back. So it was not people's favorite thing to do. They always did it with reluctance. But the time came when fewer people came back and finally nobody wanted to go and finally people refused to go. Now at first the chief and the priest, they forced them. Put that stuff on your back, get up there. Well these people found out very quickly that once they were out of sight in the forest, they could dump their load of ava and make it to someplace else to live, okay? Because they weren't slaves. Right? Uh, they might be picked again in the new place, but they might not. And of course, that was a plus for what they had at the moment. So when this started to happen, you know, finally the chiefs and priests, they got together and they had this heated debate and it lasted for days. And they finally could only come to one conclusion. They were going to have to ask Maui Kupua for help. Oh, they didn't want to do that. But there wasn't any other choice. He was the only one they knew who actually might be able to do it. So they called Maui, come to the council. And Maui came out of curiosity. They'd never called him to a council before, so what was going on? So then they told him what they wanted him to do, and he laughed, just laughed uproariously. Why would I want to do that? He said, and they said, well, because the, the chief was a pretty smart guy and one of his priests at least was very wise. And they said, well, because if you do it, we'll give you a fine koa canoe with red sails so that you can travel and see the world. Wow. They didn't tell him that they would be happy to see him go. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't tell him that they knew this was what he wanted more than anything in the world. Okay. They didn't tell him also that he was the only one left who could do it. But Maui thought about it. He thought about it for about the time it takes a tree to fall. And then he said, okay, I'll do it on one condition. Two things, rather. One, this is the only time ever. Two, when I come down from the mountain, I want that canoe on the beach, fully stocked, for a long voyage, and if it's not there, I'll drink all the ava myself. I said, okay, wonderful, wonderful. And they praised him for his commitment to the community, and he laughed and snickered. Uh, but nevertheless, they piled all the ava they could on his back, which was quite a bit, because this was Maui Kapua. Okay? And he started off upland over the plains and started into the forest. Now, Usually, it would take a person maybe one or two weeks to get to the top, but this was Maui Kapoor. He was young, strong, magical, so he got there in three days. Now, he, he was magical, right? He sh could have been able to turn himself into a bird and turn the ava into a feather and just fly straight up there, but what would be the fun in that? Maui wasn't interested in doing things the easy way just to do it the easy way. I mean, he loved climbing. He loved the forest. He loved the rain. He loved fighting wicked spirits. So, you know, this was a lark for him. This was a, a game. So he made it up in three days. Now, when he got to the top, he went to the, he found where Connie lived in his uh, compound. And he went to the, to the compound and he did a chant this is traditional. He did a, a chant of praise, uh, which would usually be a chant you'd have to do before you could enter into a, any special place, into a compound or into a hula halau or something. And so he did a very beautiful chant. 
One of the Iwaku of Kane, this is something like a messenger, spirit being who took care of stuff. So he let him into the compound. And then he took him over to a place where he could wait. And he waited, he waited, he waited. Maui hated to wait. <coughs> He wanted to be active, he wanted to be doing something, and here he is waiting. And he knew this was a god, but you know, so what? Okay? Uh, so he spent the time thinking, this guy just thinks too much of himself. I guess, what kind of a trick can I play on him? <laughs> so this is what he started thinking. So finally the time came when the great god Kani condescended to let Maui come in, and uh, Maui because he was taught how to do this by the, the chief and the priest, he begged and he groveled, uh, uh, begged Connie to make the ava, uh, and the, the ava liquid, the same word for the, for the plant and the root and the liquid. And so finally Connie took it. Now Maui is disappointed at this point because Connie disappeared. And he disappeared for a while, and then he came back and he's got this gourd with the ava liquid in it. Okay. And he hands it to Maui. So Maui, you know, gives all kinds of humble thanks and all of that backs out of the compound and out onto the barren slopes and walks very carefully for about a few ibile. Ibile is a Hawaiian measurement kind of like a yard. It's from the collarbone to the tip of the middle finger. Okay, so it's pretty close to a yard. Anyway, hmm? Evie, Evie Lay, right. And so uh, he walked for a few of those and tripped on a rock, fell down, spilled all the ava, all of it, every drop out of it, out of the gourd. Oh man, gets the gourd and comes back. He does a beautiful chant and he begs and grovels his way back into even maximum groveling now, back into the, into the compound and in front of Kane and Kane, you know, rolls his spiritual eyes and goes back, nobody knows what he does, comes back with another gourd of ava. Okay, so Maui takes that, leaves again, backing away all this groveling, goes out, and Maui managed to be incredibly unlucky and terribly clumsy because he did this three more times. Mm. Okay. Finally, on the fourth time when he came back, he just groveled to the maximum, begged to the stars, and kind of fed up with him about this time, okay? So he says, comes back in, and Connie has the ava, and he, he just makes it right in front of Maui while Maui's watching very intently. And so again, when it's finally made and the, the, he's got the gourd full of the liquid and he all oh, begs to, you know, all over the place again and Connie lets him go and he goes out. Now, by a curious, strange circumstance, Maui suddenly becomes very agile and he practically dances all the way down the mountaintop and down through the forest and down the plains and down to the coast, back to the chief and the council and there's his canoe sitting out there, okay. And, but when Maui comes, normally you would give it to the chief and to the, and to the uh, priests because they're the ones who would then dole it out. But when Maui came up with the, with the ava, he says, no, I want everybody in the whole community to be here. Because for the first time, Maui, Maui had undergone kind of a transformation. For the first time, he was experiencing what other people had to experience. And he didn't like that at all. Now, he didn't like people who were too big, but this was tyranny. Having power over somebody and making them do what you wanted without them having any say in it. So on the way down, he had decided, no, I'm always gonna do stuff for myself, but I'm also gonna do it to help people get rid of tyranny. And we know this because in other stories, um, Maui slowed down the sun for everybody in the Northern Hemisphere so that uh, they could get their tasks done during the day. He got the secret of fire and shared it with everybody. 
In other stories in the Pacific, he learned the secret of how to make rope and shared that with everybody. And over and over, also he pushed up the sky so everybody could walk upright. All of the things that he did benefited everybody. This story says it began with the Ava. And so he got everybody together and he carefully showed each and every individual how to make Ava. Okay. And so uh, from that moment on, no one ever had to ask Connie anymore for permission or for knowledge of how to make the Ava because they could do it for themselves. And they still do it for themselves today, so we know the story is true. Okay. And Connie at the time laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed up on top of the mountain because this is what he wanted. <laughs> he wanted people to find their own power. Pipi holo ke ka'au, so goes the story. All right. Now, the topic today is personal sovereignty. And we need to be clear about what that actually means. Uh, the word sovereign has to do with having the power to um, make choices, to make things happen. It has to do with power, it has to do with effectiveness, uh, and we use it today. We use it today mostly when we talk about governments, we talk about royalty, even when they're figureheads, we call them sovereigns, okay? Uh, it it uh, has to do with uh, uh, anybody who is at the top of the heap and makes the choices for other people, okay? That's sovereign. And maybe sometimes for the whole, like the United States is, is one of many today sovereign <coughs> nations. The people have a say in that. Okay? So it doesn't always have to do with one person. But nevertheless, that's sovereignty in general. Personal sovereignty is when you have the power to make your own choices. You have the power to how, not only what you choose to do, but your reactions to doing it and your reactions to what happens. Because that's a part of sovereignty too. You have the power to decide how to react to circumstances. Sometimes when you don't have, doesn't seem like you have a choice, you do have choices. You have choices on not only what to do, but you have choices on how to do it and how to adapt to it or not. These are all your choices too. This is personal sovereignty. Sounds an awful lot like free will because it's the same thing. That's what personal sovereignty is, free will. It doesn't mean that you can do anything you want. Okay. First of all, you need to know how to do it. <laughs> Second of all, there's the sovereignty of other people to take into account, whether you like it or not. Now, it's entirely possible to try and build up like some dictators do, enough personal sovereignty so that you can overcome and maybe destroy the sovereignty of others. You can't ever really truly destroy it, but you know, suppress it like crazy. Uh, that's impossible to do. But interestingly, in, in, if we look at human behavior uh, in many, so many ways throughout what we know of human history, we find that people achieve far more through cooperation than through conquering. And so working together with people for doing this, okay, always works better. But it's still your choice. Now, when some people say, well, how, how can that happen? What if there's something happens that you really don't want to do? Uh, and yet, circumstances are such that you have to do it. Well, first of all, you never have to do it. Sometimes the consequences might not be what you'd like. Sometimes it's smart to do it. But you always have a choice. I'll give you a little story. I've, I've shared this in another context. but. It fits right here. When I was in uh, the military, I was in the Marine Corps, and I was a private. Now I went in for a number of different reasons, mainly to rebuild myself, because I was pretty down at the time. And uh, it was after my father had died, and I was a lost and lonely soul for a while. And, but I still did never, ever, ever like to take orders from anybody, especially when I didn't think they were qualified. Okay. So here I am one day 
This is why I started this whole technique, because this is what I want to teach you. So I'm in the barracks. That's the place where we all had to sleep. And a corporal, whom I did not admire, uh, handed me a broom. And he said, sweep the barracks, with a very orderly voice. Well, I had a choice. I could go to the brig, which is a marine jail, and you really don't want to go there. Okay? <laughs> But I could have, okay? I had a friend who did it and he told me forever how sorry he was. <laughs> <laughs> so I could have done that, I could have made that choice. Or I could have to do something else. I did not want to take his order. Ooh, that would have been terrible. So I did something totally different. I decided for myself that I wanted to sweep the barracks. And I let him give me the broom to do it. Yes. Okay. And so I happily swept the barracks and had a wonderful time with no problem at all because I wasn't doing it because he ordered me to. I was doing it because I chose to. Now, did I like sweeping the barracks? That had nothing to do with it. But if I had continually grumbled and, and fought against it and resisted it, then I would have given him all this power. Because I also had the power and the free will to decide it wasn't important enough not to like. I didn't have to love it, although it would, I could also have made a game out of it. Okay? How much dust can I sweep under his bed and get away with it? Uh, but, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> but I made the choice to make it not important as a task. And yet make it my chosen task. And that's a fantastic way to deal with situations sometimes when the only feasible thing is to do it and yet you don't want to be under somebody else's suppression in doing it. Make it your choice. And if it's something you don't like, make that so unimportant that whether you like it or not doesn't matter anymore. You, have, you can do that. It's possible. Okay? And so that brings you back into your own personal sovereignty. Okay. If we all had personal sovereignty, if a great many people in the world took it up and began practicing that, there'd be a lot of changes. There'd be some incredible changes. Uh, for instance, a lot of trial lawyers would have to get new jobs. Okay. Uh, a lot of politicians would have to be accountable for their actions. Uh, individual people okay, would have to be accountable for their actions. You wouldn't be, here's the worst part though, I have to tell you, because this is what you've got to be careful of. It means personal responsibility. Personal sovereignty means personal responsibility. And that means you'd not be able to blame anybody for any of your problems. You wouldn't be able to blame the government. You wouldn't be able to blame God. You wouldn't be able to blame Satan. You wouldn't be able to blame your neighbor. Ooh, that's kind of a lot. But if you increase personal sovereignty enough, that's the place you get to. And in getting to that place, we'd have a world of cooperation. We'd have a world with religious tolerance. We'd have a world that would be so much fun. Wow. What kind of a world would that be? Pao Kaolelo, the tale is told. <laughs> All right. Do I have any questions or comments? Yeah. Thank you so much for your wisdom. I really have enjoyed uh, <coughs> listening to your story. And I wanted to ask um, a question about um, application, if sure. I may. Sure, sure. Uh, yesterday, I just got out of the shower and uh, my landlord uh, came on to the property uh, not invited. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so I did pretty well, you know, by what, what you're saying, yeah. um, you know, about uh, saying, oh, this must have been something that I wanted to invite here <laughs> to help me get spent long okay. to moving out of the house. And there's also legal 
ramifications of that. You know, it was sure. unlawful for him uh, to be there. So I did document the situation okay. and I sent him an email letting him know that I'd been in coordination with him about him coming on the proper, but he didn't have permission on that morning, okay. yeah? So I'm doing this balance of practicing a peaceful path in doing this, okay. but also wanting to make sure that I'm taking care of myself. Well, of course. Yeah. Peaceful path does not mean being a doormat. <laughs> it does not mean being a doormat. You know a doormat? Okay, that everybody can walk on you? Right, okay, it doesn't mean that. A lot of people have this mistaken notion that you have to be nice to everybody. Yeah. There's nothing in the rules of life that say you have to be nice to everybody. Usually it works better, but also you don't have to be angry at people and maintain the anger to get done to follow your rights and take care of yourself. You don't need anger. You just need to do what you feel is appropriate and proper and usually you're much more successful if you do it that way so if there's a legal issue that you want to follow through of course you're you have that choice okay if it's impo that important to you but you do not have to do it with anger you do not have to do it with fear okay you do it because you believe it's the right thing to do that's that's free will see okay yes <coughs> How do we handle uh, messages from spirit that, that say to do such and such a thing uh, and still maintain our own personal self? Oh, that's very simple. Tell them to take a jump. <laughs> don't, my high recommendation, you don't ever take orders from spirit. Not even your own higher self. Your higher self won't give you orders, by the way. This is your spiritual part. If you're, something is giving you orders, it's not your higher self, no matter what it says, okay? It could be an old memory pattern of a parent. It could be a mischievous, wicked spirit. You know, those things exist. Uh, it could be all kinds of things, but don't take orders. Don't even take orders from your body. You maintain your choice. If your body's telling you something's wrong, help. Help, that's only smart. But don't do it because your body says you have to. Do this, do that. You do that and you're lowering and diminishing your personal sovereignty. There is no other power in the world, in the world of spirit or in this physical world of ours that has the right to tell you what to do. The right to tell you, that's not to say they won't do it but the right to tell you what to do and make you do something. Now they can work on your fear and, they, and you can decide at some points it only makes sense to do it, but choose, choose for the best result that you can, okay? As even if sometimes it's, you don't think it's a good thing, but if you don't see any other way out, make it your choice rather than doing it out of fear that someone else is more powerful or has more authority than you. Okay? We're all made of star stuff. I think it was Carl, Carl Sagan said that. Okay? We're all made of the same stuff. We're all part of an infinite universe. Now, we assume the universe is infinite because if it isn't, there's got to be something bigger. <laughs> so you might as well go right straight to the source and declare the universe infinite. But there's a catch. Remember I said there's a catch with personal sovereignty is personal responsibility? Okay. There's a catch with the universe being infinite too because you can't have a piece of infinity. And if the universe is infinite, so are you. Now here you are focused in such a way that you're manifesting a particular individual life that's very much your own and your focus. There may come a point where you let go of that focus, but for the moment you are who you are without being separate. It's like a drop of water in the ocean or a molecule. Molecule of water in the ocean is not separate from all the other molecules. It's just a point of focus as you are in the infinite universe. So there is nothing with more authority. You don't have to accept that. I'm telling you the way we're looking at it. This is only one way to look at things. If you would like someone to have authority over you, 
like the people in the very ancient times got used to. Well, you can do that. But you don't have to, is my message. Okay? And again, you can take that or not, because you have free will. <laughs> yes? Thanks so much when you, you said, don't take orders even from your body. Yeah. Could you, could you uh, talk a little bit more about that? Because I, I think it has everything to do with healing. Sure. Your body, when your body isn't, doesn't seem to be working well, regardless of the reason, it's always stress. Now, it could be physical stress, emotional stress, what we call spiritual stress, which really means a, a kind of a, a trying to uh, move away from too much energy of people or, you know, to diminish your connections. Um, so it can be a lot of these different kinds of things. And these gives rise to physical symptoms, pain being one of the first and, and easiest to heal. But uh, sometimes there can also be problems with organs or cells or things like this. And your body is gonna let you know when something isn't working. Uh, it's a cry for help. Now here's another little interesting thing because your body has free will too. When you have an illness, it's the body trying to solve a problem when you haven't given it any other options. Okay? And so it's doing the best it can with memory, with DNA, with what other people are doing. It's like flu. We call flu a TV genic disease. Okay? It's caused by television. Okay? Uh, what we mean by that, they're not doing it so much anymore, but sometimes you come up with these ads and they teach you, especially in the fall, exactly how to have the flu. And so anybody's under stress, your coup is your body consciousness is, oh, hey, I'll do that, okay? But it's only, it's because it's trying to solve a stress problem, usually to avoid some kind of worse stress. For some people, physical stress is not as bad as emotional stress. For other people, emotional stress is not as bad as physical stress. And so different people choose different ways to deal with this, but the body's just sending you a signal. So it's not an order, unless you would interpret it that way. It's just saying, help me. Can I still ask, uh, when you say you? you ah, know, uh, okay. Who is this? Here's the tricky one. <laughs> All right, and, and I'll give you an explanation because it's useful. Okay? You are you. Now what does that mean? I said you are a point of focus in the infinite universe. Okay? That's who you are. Now for, for the sake of explaining things and being able to take certain actions in this physical, linear, sequential world of ours, uh, we sometimes we have doctors who specialize in foot care, hand care, and head care. Right? That doesn't mean the foot and the hand and the head are separate. It's still one body, influ all, they're all influencing each other. Sometimes we forget and we, th we say we take a particular medicine for our foot. Come on, it's affecting every other part of your body too, don't forget that. Okay? Still, here we are with this. Sometimes we say we have a body, a mind, and a spirit. And spirit can either mean energy or it can be a non-physical aspect of yourself. Uh, because it's easy for us to think in those terms. The body is very physical, the mind isn't, and yet it's there and somewhere. And uh, there's spirit where we get inspiration from and energy from. Uh, and it's useful sometimes to learn skills, learn different activities, to understand things, to pretend that these are separate and talk about them separately. We have a saying that which is, separation is a useful illusion, <laughs> okay? Uh, and just like we do, for instance, with the hours of the day, the day is not organized by nature into these segments. We make them up. 
Yeah, it's really useful if you want to come to a meeting at about one o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday. Okay? And so we do these useful things and we pretend that the hours are separate because it's useful. And we pretend that we have a subconscious and a conscious and a superconscious because it's easier to talk about the different behaviors and aspects that way. But what I'm saying is we are still an aspect of infinity. And we're not really separate from each other or anything. And I'm not saying it just because I'm saying if you think it through logically, you have to end up there. That's a logical conclusion. We use our wonderful analytical mind and we've got to come to that conclusion if we're honest with ourselves. So that's how we look at it. You are you. Okay. There are a lot of things in life that occur to us as individuals that we don't seem to have any control over. And that's true. You can only control what you know how to control. So when something happens which seems out of control and puts you in a situation where you have limitations that you cannot seem to do anything about, I know this is going to sound trite, but this is it. You do the best you can, which is what you are doing. And to the degree that we can, we improve that as we can, as we're able, but we have to sometimes, because it, 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 we have to do what's possible, if can, can, if no can, no can. Right. It's an old Hawaiian <laughs> saying, okay? So you have to adjust, and you have to make adjustments in how you behave and how you live and what you can do. That's part of the choice. It makes no sense and it isn't good for you to sit there and be angry about it. It gives you a false sense of power to be angry about something you can't control, including other people's behavior. Okay? So you adjust and you do what you can and when possible you learn how to do more. All right. We're, this is a free meeting, and I would like all of you to be very comfortable with that. At the same time, we have some projects as an organization. We are Aloha International that sponsors this is a nonprofit organization. We have uh, projects around the world. We have a staff of uh, almost 55 now uh, in different parts of the world teaching this knowledge, helping people. A lot of them are healers. Uh, we have a huge website with more than 300 articles on how to heal better and live better. Uh, we have uh, lots and lots of resources of people willing to help. And uh, to keep on, we even have a, a do, do things in a virtual world. But uh, we have all these things. And if you feel like helping, why well, I'm gonna pass the calabash, but that's, <laughs> Your free will, please. Uh, we're also going to do a little bit of healing here with ourselves and each other. And maybe somebody you want to help. We have this idea that telepathy is a fact of life. It's not something you have to learn. All you have to do is think about somebody and wanting to help them and they'll get the message in some way. So we have these pieces of nature from around the world that people have donated for this purpose and we're gonna do a little healing blessing at the end. So take one, pass it around. You don't have to sit and meditate, it will pick you. You just reach your hand in. And uh, uh, two days ago I was already in Hero and I got a message from a dear friend in Brazil and she had to be a uh, surgery in the brain yes. with a tumor. tumor. I, I like to put her name. Oh, of course. You can do that. 
We're all going to have the opportunity and Stuart's going to show us how. Stuart is one of our staff, lives in Kalapana. He holds a weekly Huna healing session at uh, the Kalapana Resort down there and he also does private counseling. Aloha everybody. Does everybody have a piece of nature? Yeah. Um, so I'm first going to invite you just to look at it. And as you look at it, remember what the feeling of friends is. Remember how you feel when you're with friends. And choose, if you decide to, to make this piece of nature a friend. So feel your friendship with this piece of nature. And just enjoy that sense of friendship. Savor that sense of friendship. And I invite you now to close your eyes. And to feel your friendship with your body. Allow yourself to be friends with your body. And enjoy that wonderful friendship with your body. to think of the earth and to choose to be friends with the earth. Allow yourself to enjoy your friendship with the earth and to pay attention to how you feel. And since you want your friends who need a healing to feel as good as possible, send them this wonderful feeling that you have as a friend of the universe. Let them share this magnificent feeling you're experiencing now. So bring them into your heart, bring them into this feeling, and let them be a part of your friendship There are other friends, other folks that need this wonderful energy. Bring them in too. And when you're ready, come on back. Is the 
baskets come around again. Put your loving energy with your breath into that piece of nature. Okay. All right. Very nice.